And again, my name is Jennifer Johnston and I am with Missouri State University. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, this is where I am in case you're not so familiar with Springfield, Missouri, um, right in the middle of the United States. So I'm the director of teacher training at the English Language Institute here at Missouri State University. And my education is in teaching English as a second language mainly. I've been teaching ESL for about 25 years. And interestingly, there are a lot of parallels between ESL and special education. In fact, in the United States, these learners all fall under the category of what we call exceptional student and are governed by very similar policies. Um, however, my interest in special education and learners with special needs really came about when my daughter was born with Down syndrome. This is, this is a picture of my daughter, Bella, um, on her first day in kindergarten, so just a few years ago. Um, so she was and still is attending a regular public elementary school in our town, along with her brother, Ben. And um, at different parts of the presentation, I'll come back to this picture and we'll tell you a story about her kindergarten year. But for now, I wanna focus on the parent-teacher connection. So we all know that parental involvement is important for children's education, um, but I would argue that it's even more important for children with special needs for many reasons that I'll talk about today. So just a little background about the law in the United States. Um, we're, we ha we've passed um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in 1990. And some of the core principles are individualized and appropriate education. So this means that every student with special needs has an IEP, an individual education plan and deserves an appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. And typically the least restrictive environment is the neighborhood school um, in regular education, general education environment. That's, that's considered the least restrictive environment. So that's what we aim for. And then another core principle mentioned in the law is parental participation. So it says per parents and students with disabilities are partners with educators in decision-making about students' education. So it says it right there in the law, how important the parent-teacher connection is. So I thought it would be maybe helpful to, to share a little bit about what parents of children with special needs have going on inside of our minds um, often all of these things at the same time. So first, we have to know about our child's disability. Um, a lot of times we, you know, the, our child is born and we suddenly have to become experts in this thing that we didn't know anything about before. So for example, we have to read books, uh, articles, attend conferences, um, just so that we know more about the, the needs of our child and how to help them. Um, we have to manage a lot of therapies. Um, we have to take our kids to extra therapy sessions, often several times a week. We have to suddenly become experts in special education law. Um, so we have to know the rights that our children have so that we can advocate for them. We have to work with more teachers at school than a typical child. Um, we have often to work with a special ed teacher, maybe an adaptive uh, physical education teacher, a speech pathologist, an occupational therapist, the list goes on and on. Um, most kids, most parents just have one or two teachers to, to work with. 
and we have to prepare for and attend a few IEP meetings each year. So again, that's the individual education plan. Um, so we have, have a lot of preparation to put in for those meetings and then the time that it takes for the meetings themselves. And often our kids have extra health issues that we have to worry about. Um, thankfully, not that's not always the case, but it often is. So they, they might miss more school than other kids. And that means that we as parents might have to miss work. Um, so that might affect our jobs even. And finally, um, there's a lack of understanding from other parents. Often parents can't identify with what we have going on. So sometimes it's hard for us to see other kids, our child's age and how normal, quote, they seem to be. Um, believe me, there are many positives to having a child with a disability, um, like the unconditional love they provide or the fun they bring to our house. So I don't want you to think that it's all difficult, difficult. There's lots of great things, but I wanted you to understand a little bit about what parents have to think about. So the main part of my presentation, um, I put together some tips for working with parents of children with special needs. So I've, I have 11 of them. Um, number one is don't always share negative things with us. Um, so this is for teachers, right? Um, a lot of teachers use, I don't know if this is the same all over the world, but in the US, a lot of teachers use a behavior chart like we see here. So um, they st kids start the day with green, meaning they're ready to learn. And then they either go up, hopefully, up to cool, you know, awesome, hopefully, or they go down if their behavior isn't going so well that day. Um, down from yellow, orange, red. So now I'm going to go back to um, tell you a little bit about my daughter's kindergarten year. So she started kindergarten um, with a teacher that had been working for about five years and the teacher used a chart like this. So every day at the end of the day, the kids had a calendar that they got to color in the color that they ended the day with. So my daughter comes home from school the first day. I'm you know, eager to know how it went. And I see the calendar and it's colored in yellow. So, okay, that's not so bad. It's the first day, yellow isn't so terrible. So the next day comes, it's, it's again yellow. The next day it's orange. So it's, it's alternating between yellow and orange over, this goes on and on every day. Um, and often there were little notes written on the calendar, like something about something that she had done, like she threw a toy at another student or she didn't leave the playground at recess. She doesn't like to, she loves, she loves the playground. So she doesn't wanna come in. So every day when I went to pick her up, there was this sense of dread. You know, I really felt anxious going to pick her up every day and what color is she gonna get today? And honestly, I began to worry that I would soon get a call from the school telling me that this just isn't working and that she couldn't stay in the general education classroom. So everything that I had fought for, you know, maybe was going to be taken away. So I'm going to come back to that story later and tell you more about it a little bit later on. Um, my second tip is to communicate from the beginning, not when a situation arises. In many situations, our children can't tell us about their day. Uh, my daughter in specific has major speech comprehensibility issues. So it's difficult for her to, to really tell me everything about her day. They can't tell us what they did, who they had lunch with, what homework they have, if someone hurts them. So we rely on teachers for that information. So 
teachers find a communication channel that works for both of you, both you and the parent. It could be a classroom app like Class Dojo or a messaging app like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or just a daily or weekly email check-in. But it means a lot to us parents to hear what our children are doing each day and it's really reassuring to us. Number three, don't ask us how to make our children behave in class. <laughs> we don't have it figured out either, <laughs> surprise. And really their behavior in your classroom be, will be very different from how they act at home. So just like with other children, you need to teach them your classroom norms, but unlike other children, this may take much more time. They might need visuals to help them understand. They might need peer modeling, but more than anything, they need your patience. Just stick with it and they'll, they'll get it eventually. Number four, ask us what motivates them. We do know that. So for example, my daughter gets speech therapy twice a week outside of school and she has new therapists about every six months. And she likes to test new people to see what she can get away with. So new therapists often struggle at first and they usually contact me to ask what they can do. So I tell them she loves to dance, she loves Barbies and she loves Elsa. So integrate that into your lessons. And as soon as they do that, it's magic. She becomes the hardest worker that you could ever imagine. So we do know what motivates and we're happy to share those tips with teachers. So the number five, use people first language when talking about our child and others with special needs. This is really important to parents. So don't talk about um, Bella as a Downs kid or suffering from Downs, you know, talk about her as a person with Down syndrome or talk about a child with autism. Um, I have a, you know, a chart here, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but this gives you some more examples of people first language. Um, I, it makes us feel that you value our child first for who he or she is and the disability is not the important thing. Next, don't say, I don't know how you do it. I know a lot of people think that that is a positive thing. It's showing us that, you know, you recognize that we, maybe our life is more difficult, but it kind of makes us feel like you think our lives are awful. <laughs> and honestly, we, we do it because we love our children, just like all parents love their children. And we're not special, we just do what we need to do. So just wanted to throw that one in. Um, number seven, realize that my child has many strengths and capitalize on them. Every, as we know, every child has strengths. Um, in a child with Down syndrome like Bella, her strengths are usually more social. She's amazing at leading other people. So let her be the one who lines up the kids to walk down the hall. You know, she's great at managing people. She's also very good at fine motor skills. So let her use manipulatives for math. So just figure out, just like any child, figure out what their strengths are because they do have strengths. Number eight, don't limit them and keep your expectations high. Believe that they can achieve have high expectations for them. So here I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna pause for just a second and share a quick, hold on, if I can, let's see. Okay, just stop that for one second and I'm going to share a quick short video clip with you um, this is a woman named, a young woman named Megan, and she has Down syndrome. And she, in the video, she's already graduated from high school, and she's talking to teachers, giving them some advice about inclusion. So we're just going to watch about a minute and a half of this video. 
Um, hopefully the sound will be good. Public speaker. I have a lot of skills. I have a lot of dreams. What I want to say is to you, don't limit me. Don't limit me by thinking that I can't learn in your classroom. Don't limit me by thinking that I will always need someone to help me. Don't limit me by having low expectations for me. Include me in all your students in your circle of learning while you are planning for my world-class education. Think about how I have the same needs as our students. We all need web skills. We all need work skills. I, I need four years to teach me skills beyond reading and math. Teach me how to learn and teach me how to act. Think about what I need to know to be able to do when I leave school. Help me learn to be independent in class. Help me learn to be independent with friends. Help me learn to be independent and safe when you're around our school. Teach me to be independent so I can become an independent adult. I need to work independently. I need to speak up for myself. Don't limit me. But teaching me to depend on others. Teach me respect, because respect is give and take. Or me the same behavior, expectations of others in your classroom. Teach me how to behave. Okay, we could. I loved listening to that. We could we could listen to the whole thing, and I'll I'll share the link to the video for you, um, in case you'd like to to watch the whole thing. It's about four minutes long, so it's not very long, but it's it's really great, I think, to hear from, from um, self-advocates, really. Okay. Go back. Okay. So um, number nine, um, also it's really helpful if teachers educate parents on the laws. Many parents don't even realize that they need to learn about laws. They often trust that the school will always have their kids' best interest at heart. And this isn't always true, unfortunately, because schools are under budget restrictions and might have that as a bigger priority. So be a co-advocate for our kids and educate us on their rights. Number 10, in IEP meetings, please understand we will feel emotional. We constantly question whether we're doing enough for our children or fighting hard enough for them. It's also hard for us to hear that they're performing at several grade levels below their peers. So one important thing that teachers can do is get IEP documents to parents in advance so we have time to, to look through them and process our thoughts and feelings. It's really hard for us to see that information right at the meeting and then have to have all of those feelings about it. So give us, give us some time and also encourage us to bring a support person to take notes so that if we are feeling emotional, we have someone there that's being um, less emotional and um, can listen and take notes so that we, we get all of the information that we need. And my last tip, help promote a culture of inclusion school-wide. Um, ask parents, ask us to present information about our child's disability to a class or at an assembly. I've been asked to read books um, about Down syndrome, grade appropriate books in, in my child's school. Um, I've presented at assemblies um, during Down Syndrome Awareness Month. So show, show us that the school cares and that they value having our child at the school. Maybe have a special day where the kids wear um, the colors of that disability like um, blue and yellow represent Down Syndrome or even have a fundraiser. I don't know if that's something that other countries do, but in the US schools have fundraisers um, because they're, they always are needing money. So um, our, our school did a fundraiser for the local Down syndrome group and they raised quite a bit of money and, and presented it. So 
these things are really meaningful to parents. And I also wanted to make a quick point that in true inclusion starts at the top. Principals have to truly believe that having students with special needs makes the school a better place. We're very fortunate at our school to have a principal who believes that. And here's the principal dressed up as Olaf because Bella told him he needed to be Olaf when she dresses like Elsa for Halloween. So he truly loves her and values her as an important part of the school. So to sum up, believe in our kids. They will change the lives of their classmates and of everyone at the school. Let us know how we can support you. Establish a clear channel of communication. And back, um, back to the, the story that we left off. Um, remember, I was getting the reports uh, about behavior every day for several weeks. And after, um, after a few weeks, they stopped coming. And I didn't hear anything from the teacher for a while, which I was okay with. I, I was just hoping that things were working out and, and it was going fine and that I would get a call if it wasn't. So the teacher emailed me to tell me around the end of the first semester of school in December. She emailed me to tell me that I was invited to the school because she had nominated Bella for a good behavior award that the school gives every month at an assembly. So special children are, are chosen to get this award. And she had nominated my daughter who had gotten all of those colors at the beginning of the school year. She had nominated her for a good behavior award. I was shocked. <laughs> um, but the lesson here that I want to leave you with is the teacher never gave up on her. She could have said, you know, she's just better off in special ed. She can't handle the regular classroom. It's not going to work. That's what, unfortunately, some teachers do. She stuck with Bella, and it paid off. And she taught Bella the norms of how to act in a classroom and in school. And since then, I have never gotten a bad behavior report on her. And I'll always be grateful to that teacher for what she did. She set her up for success for the rest of her school life. So I hope that you've gotten some insight into how you can better work with parents of your students with special needs. And if you have any questions or comments, I can take them now, but also feel free to contact me at either of these email addresses. And I really appreciate you giving me time to speak with you today. Thank you so much.